Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr Windsor Holden, the Head of Forecasting and Consultancy at Juniper Research. With me today are Head of Research, Nitin Bass, and Research Analyst, uh, Nick Maynard. Uh, and we'll be talking through our top 10 predictions for 2018 and also uh, assessing the outcomes of some of the predictions that we made last year. Uh, these will be followed uh, by a Q&A session. To begin with, a little uh, background to Juniper Research, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, we were formed back in 2001, and initially our research offering was focused primarily on the mobile space, but over the years it's evolved significantly to now cover a vast array of connected services and devices, including smart cities, uh, connected cars, 5G networks, smartphones, tablets, uh, commerce and fintech. Um, as you can see from the right-hand side of the slide, we're a trusted research partner of many of the world's leading organisations and we provide both a combination of off-the-shelf research and bespoke uh, projects uh, now covering more than 50 markets within the digital uh, ecosystem. And our team specialises in identifying uh, changes and disruption in the market. Now, uh, for the past eight years, we've been bringing out a set of end of year predictions in which we've been looking <clears throat> at the key technologies, devices and services that we expect to be setting trends and disrupting industries over the next uh, 12 months. So we'll be looking uh, at what legislative changes are planned, what product launches are in the pipeline, what's expected to be hot at key um, industry showcases like CES or the Mobile World Congress. Uh, we've been speaking with senior executives across an array of verticals to gauge their thoughts on uh, core developments in the, in the coming months. Uh, and then our analyst team has whittled down a long list of possible trends into a shorter list of probables. And these have then been ranked on their likely overall impact in 2018 to give us our latest set of uh, top 10 predictions. Now, for this webinar, we've put together a couple of slides on each of the trends. Uh, for each trend, we've, uh, been, we'll be exploring four key aspects, which you can see on the right-hand side here. What is the opportunity? Why 2018? Who will benefit? And lastly, what do we predict will happen? Um, now, where relevant, we've also included the title of existing Juniper Research uh, topics in the area in question on the second of the two slides per topic area. Now, when my colleagues and I have run through the list in reverse order, we'll be answering a few of your questions. You can send your questions to us while the webinar's in uh, progress. On the webinar, there's a box called a chat box in which you can type your question and then click send. We'll answer any remaining questions via email after the webinar. Now, before we go through this year's um, predictions, I'd like to take a, a look through a few of, uh, of last year's. Now, firstly, what we got right. Um, we've scored all those predictions we believe hit the mark, and in most cases, we believe we actually did hit the mark on a scale between one and three ticks. For those we awarded three ticks, we believe the scale of the activity was particularly noteworthy. Uh, let's look at those first. Now, at number seven, we said that there would be a battle of the voice assistants, and we've now seen the big three all release smart speaker devices as well as move towards partnerships with hardware providers to house multiple assistants. Uh, the battle is underway and you could say it's already showing signs of an eventual uh, armistice. Uh, meanwhile, at number 10, we said that bots would be hot. Uh, well, they've been one of the most talked about technologies of the year, with payment providers now looking at implementing them over social media. Now, if you look, uh, you can see there were several other areas where the market began to ramp up quite significantly, and we've given those uh, two ticks. So at the top of the leaderboard there, you, uh, you can see we correctly anticipated that eSports would hit the mainstream, uh, while at number four, uh, blockchain deployments have also begun moving beyond the financial industry with the proofs of concept and trials in areas ranging from logistics to land registry. Meanwhile, if we move down to number eight, um, we expected to see significant progress on autonomous vehicle re uh, regulation and the US has implemented a raft of laws pertaining to testing. Now, where we were a little off target, 
we'd said that consoles would reinvent themselves, uh, breaking the traditional six to eight year generational cycle and becoming a 4K HDR entertainment center as standard. While uh, advances have been made with the launch of the Xbox One X, uh, content has not become universal and Sony have not responded in the way we anticipated that they would. Um, full deployment of 4K content via consoles will take considerably longer than we predicted. So what does next year hold in store? Well, um, to begin with, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague Nitin Bass, who will lead you in with number 10, Wireless Charging Moves Up a Gear. Thank you, Inter. Uh, so we now have two new iPhones from Apple, the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 10. Uh, these devices support the Wireless Power Consortium's Qi wireless charging, um, and that too without the need for charging accessories. Uh, with this move, Apple has joined the likes of Samsung, LG, Motorola, and, and other Android smartphone makers in supporting uh, the standard. Uh, some of these players also support the Air Fuel Alliance specification, uh, but Apple does not. With this commitment, one could argue that um, Apple's choice has effectively decided the wireless charging standards battle um, in favor of Qi. Uh, well, at least in terms of uh, uh, smartphones. Look, iPhone customers are, are, are a price demographic for many businesses. Uh, so supporting Qi charging is now going to be a higher priority for, 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 the, for those businesses, uh, which include hotels, car manufacturers, um, uh, furniture industry and uh, other smartphone OEMs. This is the final part of, of, of the wireless charging ecosystem uh, which needs to fall into place to enable, uh, to enable wireless charging for, for most uh, smartphone users. Uh, and now this can begin immediately thanks to the standards commitment to backwards compatibility enabling uh, businesses uh, to invest in wireless charging facilities uh, now, without the risk that they will become obsolete by a new specification in, in, in the future. Uh, moving to our next slide. So, so Juniper believes that this uh, will boost uh, the position of the Wireless Power Consortium, who will now become um, uh, the de facto standard for sm smartphone wireless charging. Uh, this is where the majority of the attention for consumer wireless charging has been focused. And, and we expect them to be the most uh, successful specification in this space. Um, so as a result, uh, we will see Qi wireless charging emerge as a, as a mainstream technology for smartphone charging throughout 2018. Uh, now that both device manufacturers as well as the service providers can be assured of a, of a much wider addressable market. Um, I think this will also produce a degree of lock-in uh, for smartphone OEMs who will not want to alienate uh, their existing users by not supporting uh, the incre increasingly common standard. Uh, and also, making any changes after 2018 will, will become more difficult uh, for them to accomplish. Uh, so this will also benefit selected industries that can offer wireless charging as a, as a benefit of their products and services. Uh, the, the, the most immediate impacts will be felt in areas of, of the hospitality industry, uh, like hotels and coffee shops, where, where you could argue that wireless charging will emerge as a, a Wi-Fi-like service. Uh, we also expect Qi wireless charging to become a more standard uh, part of vehicle design uh, as a result of this, uh, this decision. Now, as a result of the increased publicity, we expect over 700 million smartphones uh, to use the technology by the end of next year. And as uh, and as shown in the chart on the right, uh, we have also forecast over 180 um, million transmitters to be present across public, commercial, automotive, and 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 consumer channels. Um, however, beyond smartphones, it will be a slightly different story. The air fuel products have shifted towards far field wireless charging and higher powered charging for laptops and, and similar devices. Uh, while Qi also supports these form of use cases, the, the organization has focused uh, more on smartphones to a large extent. Uh, this means that 2018 we'll see uh, we'll start to see a two-speed wireless charging market emerge, with Qi for focused on smartphones, wearables, and smaller consumer devices, and air fuel powering uh, much larger devices, although uh, like laptops, but 
but with support dropping away from from air fuel in recent years, um, this may not last long. Uh, now over to Nick. Thanks, Nitin. So at number nine, we have uh, we expect 2018 to be the year that smart toys educate the masses. So what is a smart toy? Juniper defines these as toys that have embedded communications, enabling them to interface with a mobile device or games console. Now, the term smart toy has often been applied to older toys that incorporate some limited smart features. So here we're really talking about voice recording or speech features, and that's what really makes a definition of what we're talking about necessary. Many of the smart toys currently on the market, such as the very popular Furby Connect, have been deemed to have unsecure communications features. As such, smart toys will move to focus on the more educational benefits that smart toys can bring, or so-called edutainment. So why 2018? Well, Juniper believes that this will be the year that sees these educationally focused toys, with their focus on coding hitting the more mainstream market. While some educational smart toys are available in certain markets already, there has been limited market penetration by these so far. The general concern on security with other smart toys will encourage their growth in this direction. The Lego Boost, for example, it's been recently launched to some great critical acclaim. And toys from Anki, such as Cosmo, they've also been showing some really advanced features. Juniper believes that these early examples are just a sample of the potential offered by this really interesting market approach. Okay, on to the next slide. So who do we think will benefit from this? Well, it's likely that smart toys having an educational focus will have multiple advantages. Firstly, um, the manufacturers themselves will see boosted sales as they transition away from these toys with security concerns to the ones that are more educationally focused. Manufacturers will be able to take advantage of this trend to surpass the $4.97 billion in sales in 2017 that's noted in the chart to the right of the slide. These toys will also have enhanced margins from their higher price point. From a marketing point of view as well, they will be able to obtain a significant advantage from this new focus. There will be a broader benefit in terms of education. In many countries, particularly the US and UK, there is a focus on boosting participation in STEM subjects. And by this, I really mean uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as boosting credentials in computing. This is because over the sort of the next 50 years, the shape of the workforce is really going to change dramatically with AI and automation taking hold. As such, the skills required are very different smart toys will have a really big role to play in this. There are also opportunities for some traditional toy makers, for example, Hasbro and Mattel. Um, there have been limited forays into these areas by them. For example, the dancing bell doll from Beauty and the Beast. Juniper expects that traditional toy manufacturers will increasingly go down this route, using the higher price point to generate higher margins for them. Internet connected toys such as Cloud Pets will see significantly reduced sales due to their perceived laxity and security. For more coverage on this and other trends, please see the link at the bottom of the slide for our latest comprehensive research piece. And with that, back to you, Linda. Thanks, Nick. So at number eight, we've got Chinese cards and wallets achieving scale in Western markets. So what's the opportunity here? Well, firstly, it's represented by the soaring scale of spend by Chinese tourists overseas. If you look at the top chart on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, between 2014 and 2016, the annual spend by Chinese tourists abroad rose from 141 billion to 261 billion. Secondly, the key Chinese card and wallet providers, Unipay, Alipay and WeChat, uh, they're dealing with an increasingly saturated home market, and in Union Pay's case, the, the ending of a monopoly. And they're therefore very keen to leverage their key strengths and assets on the international stage. Now, furthermore, there are opportunities well beyond the tourist trade. Um, you can see a few key data points on, uh, on the lower side of the slide to the right. Uh, there are more than 50 million individuals of Chinese descent elsewhere in the world, with many immigrant workers also sending money back to China. Now, the hope of the Alipays, the 
um, WeChat and the union pays is that ultimately usage spreads beyond the tourists, beyond the immigrant workers to wider demographics, enabling them to mount a still stronger challenge to Visa, MasterCard and PayPal. Now, to that end, they've been assiduously building partnerships over the past 12 to 18 months with leading retailers, point of sale solutions providers and money transfer providers across Europe and the US. So, for example, Alipay's uh, it started rolling out in-store payments in Europe last year. Uh, Union, uh, Union Pay is seeking to build international acceptance of its cards through the uh, Union Pay online payment solution, which is now being offered uh, via Payment Express in Australia and New Zealand uh, and by other players in the US, Canada and Southeast Asia. Uh, and it's also emerged that uh, Huawei, which debuted its own OEM Pay service in China last year, has filed for a trademark with the European Union Intellectual Property Office and for a patent with the US uh, Patent Office, suggesting that the company is also seeking to launch in leading Western markets in the medium term. So, where are the benefits? Well, for consumers, in the first instance, Chinese tourists, the, the benefits are clear. Uh, there's an increased opportunity to use payment mechanisms with which they are familiar at home. Uh, Juniper estimates that in China, more than 160 million individuals used mobile wallets to make in-store payments last year, spending more than $23 billion uh, in the process. Similarly, the merchants who add these mechanisms are reducing friction at point of sale uh, and can increase conversion rates. Um, now, finally, for the wallets themselves, opening up an international front is the main realistic means through which significant growth can be achieved both through retail and P2P payments. Uh, so we anticipate that if Ant Financial's acquisition of MoneyGram is approved, uh, then uh, Alipay should start to gain significant traction in the uh, international P2P space. Uh, and indeed, the battle between Alipay and WeChat will increasingly be played out on an international rather than domestic stage. Uh, now, here's Nick to tell you about how machine learning is coming to verify your identity. Thanks, Windsor. So, what's the concept we're talking about here? Juniper believes that technology vendors are going to use a combination of machine learning and smartphone connectivity to create and verify digital identity. Now, ID verification at present is a, really a largely manual process. Account opening in most areas for banks usually involves checking several identity documents in person. This process, which is known as Know Your Customer, is largely inefficient and time consuming. Machine learning is developing to such a level, um, assisted by the, the growth in power of uh, graphical processing units, um, and it's advanced to the point where it can be used to verify a person's identity based on their official ID. Machine learning can compare a selfie with a photo ID, verifying that the right elements are present on the face and therefore moving to eliminate identity fraud. So why 2018? Well, Juniper believes that 2018 will be the year that these digital solutions become commonplace. This will be based on the increasing demand from uh, financial institutions for more efficient processes that allow them to reduce their massive regulatory compliance burden. Now, this change in the market will also be driven in 2018 by the really positive framework that's being created by the regulators. For example, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK has been a world leader in creating so-called regulatory sandboxes. And this is where companies, so both existing players and new entrants to markets, they can test new products without a massive regulatory headache. So who's going to benefit from this? Well, it's likely that financial institutions will be the main beneficiary of the introduction of this approach. Financial institutions presently spend an absolutely enormous amount on compliance, particularly on Know Your Customer. The introduction of machine learning and digital identity will allow these processes to be increasingly automated, reducing both the number of staff involved and the overall cost of the process. There'll also be a, a benefit for the end user. So at present, opening an account can be a long and frustrating process. 
particularly in areas such as wealth management. And this is really where additional regulations such as anti-money laundering regulations need to be followed very strictly. By introducing a verified digital identity, the lead time for account initiation will be massively reduced and that will provide a much better service to the end user. There will be additional benefits for technology providers as well. So providers uh, such as on FIDO, they'll be able to harness significant revenues by reducing the overall cost of compliance for FIs. And as you can see on the chart to the right, this revenue uh, opportunity is hugely significant. And we're talking about uh, $76.3 billion in 2022. Furthermore, as these systems rely on connectivity, there'll be opportunities in providing the data systems to fulfill these requirements. And there'll also be security implications for such sensitive data, and that'll open up opportunities for security providers as well. And Juniper's prediction is that mainstream banks in the UK and US will adopt these solutions for account opening and verification. And with that, it's over to Nitin. Okay, so at number six, we have uh, the rise of robot devices and app-based investments. Um, I'm sure we could all agree that robot devices are, are viewed as one of the most disruptive of AI-influenced uh, fintech services. Uh, j j just to define robot devices here, uh, software will assume the role of a financial advisor and perform uh, duties such as uh, portfolio management with little or in some cases no no human intervention. Uh, they rely on technology uh, rather than a financial planner to deliver financial advice at any time of the day. Integration of AI into financial services such as uh, portfolio management software offers service provi providers a substantial uh, time saving. Uh, data ga gathering and interpretation is performed by the AI. Uh, within the context of the cu customer's appetite for risk and existing uh, investment. So why 2018? Um, we think 2018 uh, will be marked uh, by the attraction of millennials into, into AI-enabled savings and investment solutions. Uh, the use of the smartphone app as a medium combined with, uh, with the rise of, uh, of, of, of the so-called uh, digital-only challenger banks uh, will attract users traditionally uh, discouraged by such financial services. While robo-advisory services have been in existence for nearly a decade, uh, the combination of accessible computing resources, especially for uh, algorithm training, uh, new entrants to the market, and, and increased consumer awareness has resulted in regulatory bodies uh, seeking to understand uh, both the size and growth of the market, especially in order to help help determine the regulatory path. Um, uh, most regulatory bodies around the globe have uh, have uh, specifications in place for for financial advisory services uh, concerning uh, conduct, uh, trading practices, um, disclosure requirements, as well as um, rules for data security. As such, these regulations can be applied to both uh, traditional advisory services as well as uh, digital ones. Uh, the other advantage to, uh, to robo-advisors is that it reduces the operational costs um, and with better AI you get better um, savings. So in this context, it is, it is important to first uh, examine the various roles that AI can play in a robo-advisory service. As, as, as we can see on the right, uh, we have uh, Juniper has defined uh, the uh, various roles that AI could um, or robot devices could play. We have classified it as uh, uh, assistant, uh, advisor, and actor. Uh, in 2018, robot advisory services will continue to be positioned either as assistants or advisors. Then that's what we believe. Uh, in these cases, uh, players are still required to employ a significant number of uh, investment uh, professionals to oversee um, various accounts. Uh, just to give an example, Nutmeg uh, is an online uh, investment management service and could be classified as an advisor. Uh, but by elevating the role of, of AI to an actor, uh, operational costs can uh, thus be saved by reducing the number of uh, investment professionals employed at, uh, at the company. Uh, fully automated robot devices will ultimately prevail 
um, is that, that's something that we strongly believe uh, at least in the in the long term uh, especially owing to their ability to generate much better returns for the mass market so just to conclude this slide the establishment of a settled regulatory environment should help lower costs for robot advisor uh, robot advisor players uh, uh, especially as the playing field will be level from the outset, meaning few uh, required changes to services. And also, uh, in the short term, uh, we believe that consumer awareness of robo-advisory services will increase simply via word of mouth uh, spurred on uh, by uncertain economic conditions driving consumers away from uh, cash savings. So, who will benefit? Um, by using AI, uh, robo advisory firms are able to produce, for example, as I mentioned earlier, suggested uh, investment portfolio in, in, in a fraction of the time it takes a human being. Uh, Betterment is one of the leading and most uh, well known robo advisory services service provider, um, and we have sized it uh, above many other products. Uh, similarly, apps like Moneybox, which combine convenient uh, roundup, uh, roundup contributions, with robot advice uh, managed investments uh, we believe these apps will attract large user bases in 2018. Um, globally we forecast that that there will be around 30 million individuals using robot advisory services in 2018 as you can see on the uh, on the chart uh, to the right uh, and we forecast that this will rise to approach uh, approximately 100 million by 2020 However, Juniper believes that the challenge for robot advisors targeting the mass market, which is defined, which could be defined by something that's below the 20,000 minimum initial investment, um, is achieving a profitable business model. And we discuss this in depth in our upcoming FinTech Futures and AI in FinTech research reports. Um, links can be found here uh, on this presentation. Um, and also, we, we expect traditional players, uh, especially major banks, to move into this sector to compete in this space by offering, uh, you know, much more compelling uh, digital experiences. Uh, so now it's on to number five. That's uh, facial recognition applications surge. Uh, thanks, Nitin. So... While Apple has been criticised for uh, jettisoning fingerprint authentication for facial recognition in the iPhone X, there's no doubt that uh, next year we'll see far more applications uh, of the facial recognition technology, applications that extend well beyond authentication and payments. So why 2018? Well, we believe that the implementation of facial recognition in the iPhone X will be the catalyst for, the, for innovation and the introduction of new use cases. Apple is very good at educating the marketplace. It effectively created a consumer smartphone space. It created a tablet space. It might not necessarily be the first player in a particular market, but it's exceptionally good at spreading the message and enabling services to gain wider adoption on the back of that education. Indeed, facial recognition per se, even in the mobile area, is not new. Witness the applications ranging from border security to Facebook's image recognition. But more sophisticated iterations, like uh, that in the iPhone X, cannot be spoofed with a photograph. Um, for example, Apple's uses a combination of an infrared camera, a flood illuminator, a regular camera, and a dot projector to gauge depth. Meanwhile, other handset vendors are also beginning to introduce more sophisticated sensors, including LG with the, the V30, Q6, and the G6. So you've got this combination <clears throat> of increased availability, increased awareness, uh, increased awareness of and increasing end user affinity with facial recognition. At the same time, key players in the industry are starting to offer products to capitalize upon this. So, for example, SAP has recently introduced a host of new features around facial recognition, uh, offering software that can determine a shopper's gender and age. Meanwhile, a number of governments are considering uh, more deployments. For example, 
uh, the, the viability of replacing ankle tag security with a combination of facial recognition and GPS. So a number of players across an array of uh, industry verticals stand to benefit here. Clearly, the, um, the increased demand for more sophisticated sensors plays to the strengths of companies like uh, Qualcomm, Sensory and MediaTek. And it was recently reported that Qualcomm and HiMax Technologies are going to be starting volume production of new 3D depth sensing uh, modules as early as the end of this year, which means that the first Android devices with those uh, could appear uh, sometime during next year. Um, now, for consumers, the benefits will vary depending upon the applications in question. But to begin with, the clear advantage comes in terms of increased security. Uh, while for retailers, the technology provides opportunities for a far, far greater degree of personalization and targeting. Um, in indeed, we anticipate that 2018 will be the year in which brands seek to capitalize on, on it uh, by developing um, highly personalized ad hoc campaigns, dipping their toe into the water of the technology, as it, as it were. We also think that we'll start to see more applications of facial recognition to enable invisible payments, such as those employed within Amazon Go, to reduce the level of in-store friction still further. Uh, now over to Nitin for number four. Okay, at number four we have edge computing to fast track uh, the IoT. Now, edge computing is something we have uh, discussed widely in our previous webinars and, and, and various uh, client sessions. So just to understand what it really means, and, uh, and this is to, to, to an extent illustrated in the chart on the right, uh, basically management of devices and data analysis uh, is often performed in the cloud or in remote data centers. Now, operators and IoT providers are increasingly consider considering an uh, edge computing um, a model in which much of this processing power and data processing is moved uh, to, to, to the edge of the network, enabling devices and, 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 and connected sensors to transmit uh, data to a gateway device. In 2018, we believe that a number of IoT service providers will enable an edge computing model as a way of uh, maximizing their services. Uh, so therefore, uh, service providers must consider offering this option through through investment in their networking architecture as they forecast the rise of uh, both IoT devices and and the data generated by these devices is likely is likely to create a, a demand for for the service. Unlike many believe, edge computing is not going to be a direct competition to the cloud uh, model. Uh, indeed, it is likely that the two will work together in the vast majority of use cases. Uh, uh, for, 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 for example, let's take smart cities. Uh, smart city devices will send data to a cloud storage device for, for recording of data at a city level. Uh, however, for, for more, more localized areas, such as a small area of the road network, uh, we expect that edge computing will play a pivotal role in, in delivering efficient services. In the future, um, operators will begin to realize a return on investment through, through the cost savings gained by reducing uh, the load of the network. And this reduction in data traffic will be achieved by pushing the cloud uh, to the fringe of the network. Uh, additionally, this also reduces the amount of time uh, data needs to travel, meaning those devices will need the maximum bandwidth necessary to operate um, efficiently. Uh, so, one of the most notable and widely quoted uh, product launches of an IoT device using um, edge computing is a NES um, IQ uh, indoor security camera. So the camera basically leverages on device uh, computer vision processing, thus thereby uh, reducing strain on the network by not having to send raw video data. Uh, in addition, uh, by processing the data on the device itself, accuracy and speed of the alerts will be greatly improved over in comparison with cloud computing. Uh, we believe that edge computing will take a similar route where the full where the full extent of the network is realized through the capabilities of of, of the end device or or in this instance the data center at the edge of the mobile network. 
Um, however, this uh, decentralizing of the network presents um, significant challenges in, in, in providing a level of network security that will be required for IoT services. Uh, and especially considering the scale of connected devices, uh, we, we Juniper forecasts nearly t just over 23 billion uh, connected units in 2018. Um, so, so by increasing the network area, this leaves IoT devices uh, increasingly susceptible to attacks. Uh, additionally, this means much of the data will be housed within the device itself. Therefore, uh, therefore, an increased focus on device level security will be much needed. Now, operators notably averse to, to capital investment into network infrastructure must consider shifting their attitudes to, to provide for such micro data centers uh, closer to the network base stations in order to enable, uh, as we discussed earlier, the faster network speeds and lower latency, which, you know, that will be needed for IoT verticals, especially uh, connected vehicles and other smart city devices. Okay, so now that brings us to our top three predictions for 2018 and over to Nick for number three. Thanks, Nitin. So at number three, we have AI and blockchain to power numerous fintech and insurance solutions. So Juniper believes that 2018 is the year that the deployment of blockchain will move beyond straightforward banking applications and into lots of other areas such as uh, money transfer and remittances, insurance and digital identity verification. These applications will include providing the infrastructure for P2P payments as well as uh, powering insurance smart contracts, so for example usage-based car insurance and for storing digital identity. Uh, in particular, digital identity, for example, can be verified using the date details held on a blockchain. So uh, in insurance, for example, uh, since October 2016, five leading insurance firms, including uh, Alliance, Munich, Re and Zurich, launched the B3i, which is the Blockchain Insurance Industry Initiative. And that's with the aim of enabling insurers and reinsurers to get better insights into the um, how applicable blockchain technology is in the insurance market. These initial five participants have been joined by a further 10 insurance firms, and again this includes some big names such as Aegeus and Liberty Mutual. This shows that there has already been significant influence on insurance from blockchain. So why do we think this is going to happen in 2018? Well, we believe that 2018 will be the year these blockchain-based solutions will see widespread adoption. Our recent uh, blockchain enterprise survey found that many companies are now actively considering blockchain deployment, with a significant proportion anticipating integration of blockchain, blockchain into their systems within the next 18 months, and that's outside of just banking. Increased demand for blockchain solutions will be based on the requirement of financial institutions to make their existing processes more efficient. This will be particularly important in their trading and regulatory compliance operations, where data really needs to be shared between entities in an effective and verifiable way. Blockchain is a great fit for these use cases. Blockchain is also becoming more established, so as trials with financial institutions have matured, a level of trust has started to emerge within the financial services sector. Now that blockchain has proven its basic concept, 2018 will be the year that we start to see mass deployment. So moving on to the next slide, who's going to benefit from this change? Large financial institutions, they're likely to be the biggest beneficiaries of the deployment of blockchain. For big banks, for example, this will allow them to automate parts of their regulatory compliance systems, which will realise significant savings for them. The employment of AI in conjunction with this will allow for complex analysis, which will generate useful insights for the banks. Insurers will also benefit. Um, they share a lot of the compliance issues that the banks have, and they will also be able to leverage blockchain combined with AI to permit the faster payment of claims, as well as to make general account management just far easier and far more automated. Claims payment will improve in particular, as AI can assess the claim in an automated fashion, carrying out anti-fraud checks as it does so. And there's a great opportunity here for this technology to be combined with AI-powered chatbots as well. And there's some vendors starting to do this already, in particular Lemonade in the US. 
So um, digital identity verification can also leverage blockchain um, to improve its general efficiency. So blockchain can be used to store customers' identities, and then the customer themselves can grant authorized access to that data. And what that will do is that will really significantly reduce duplication of such actions as know your customer checks, and that will really improve the customer experience. So our prediction is that 2018 will see the adoption of AI and blockchain in conjunction at scale by financial institutions. These will be leveraged to improve their operating efficiency as well as the customer's experience. Blockchain will really establish itself as a crucial technology outside of banking, with insurers one of the first to make large scale adoptions. As you can see in the chart to the right, our survey found that there were significant levels of interest in blockchain outside of banking, and this will quickly move to have an impact in 2018. And that's over to Nitin for number two. Thank you, Nick. Um, so at number two, we have Apple, Facebook, Google bring social payments to the masses. Now, social media and messaging, uh, two things that has uh, re revolutionized the way consumers bank. Um, especially for making payments, uh, the availability of payment mechanisms such as Apple Pay and Android Pay, uh, PayPal and Union Pay, etc., means that mobile users are now beginning to trust these players more uh, with their finance. If you look at the past few years, technology players or digital enablers were a long way away from attaining a strong consumer trust and preference, and and this. This has changed consistently in the past 12 months, uh, especially in, in emerging markets. And uh, this is quite evident in markets such as China, where, as Windsor earlier mentioned, Alipay and WeChat Pay has, uh, you know, has and continued to witness tremendous success in, in domestic money transfer services. Uh, in 2018, consumers will continue to have a greater offering of payment products. As, as a wealth of uh, companies seek to take advantage of technology and, uh, and, and, and regulatory changes, uh, in addition to an increased competition from uh, digital-only service providers offering uh, no to zero to lower uh, transaction fees. So Juniper believes that 2018 is going to be the year for uh, social payments with key launches from Apple and Facebook uh, expected to drive the much delayed social payments market uh, more as a subsector of the wider mobile P2P market. Um, we believe that these players, alongside some of the other technology players, will bring social payments to, to the mass market, to the masses. Now, following initial trials, um, Apple rolled out its um, Apple Pay Cash in the US uh, recently, um, where users are able to use iMessage, uh, you know, the text messaging service, to to transfer money to to other Apple users just as a text message, and and once you receive it, you tap on the message to receive the funds, which then gets instantly added to to an Apple Pay cash card uh, in the wallet app. Uh, the card's funds can be used to make purchases using um, Apple Pay contactless or in-app purchases or even can be uh, withdrawn to a bank account. So we expect Apple Pay Cash to come to the UK and other European markets in 2018 and also to other markets where Apple Pay is currently available. Uh, similarly, we also expect launches from uh, Facebook. Uh, so after 28 uh, or so months in the US, the company recently launched in the UK and France in, 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 that was in November. Um, so in fact, uh, Facebook has an e-money license in Europe. So, so more launches from the player, uh, you know, the more launches are very likely, uh, in 2018. Uh, we also expect similar launches from Google. Uh, in fact, Google launched its, uh, social payment app days in, uh, India in September. Uh, that was linking up with several major banks in the country by way of UPI, um, uh, unified payments interface. Uh, primarily for payments, but also for P2P uh, money transfers. So, uh, so that's one thing, and uh, and it is worth noting that this is set to become bigger with WeChat and Alipay uh, entering the Western market. Uh, WeChat Pay is also, an, you know, recently announced a number of partnerships with European banks, so we expect that to continue. We are also witnessing payments uh, 
platforms integrating chat services, uh, so the other way around. Um, if you take the example of Paytm, uh, the biggest wallet provider in India, uh, they, they, they are entering messenger chat services via its uh, payment wallet, um, and they've called it Inbox. Um, so just moving to the next slide. So as I just mentioned, it, it, it was always inevitable that players, including the likes of Facebook and Apple, uh, will follow the steps of WeChat and, and, and offer social media apps providing a, a universal set of features integrating payments. And uh, the forthcoming PSD2 uh, inside the EU promises to open up the payments market to to more technology players, especially the GAFA group, you know, we've just uh, mentioned Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon, uh, and, and other, other technology players, which will drastically increase competition to banks as well. So consequently, we have, uh, as a result, we have re recently revised upwards our outlook for P2P payments, social payments, especially in the US. Uh, Juniper forecasts that the total number of mobile P2P transactions will approach 90 billion in volume in 2018, accounting for nearly 590 uh, billion in transaction value. Uh, we also forecast that the number of active uh, mobile P2P users, not registered but actively conducting uh, transactions, to exceed 1.5 billion uh, next year. So once again, we we discuss this further in our upcoming research on digital money transfer and remittances. So, so please feel uh, free uh, feel free to check that research out when it comes out in January. Um, and uh, well, then uh, we've had numbers ten to two. Now over to Windsor to reveal our number one technology prediction for twenty eighteen. Thanks, Nitin. And at number one. Juniper believes that Amazon and Facebook will lead OTT bids for major sporting rights next year. Now, the emergence of multiple players within the subscription video on demand market has provided intense competition for the traditional broadcasters. Players such as Amazon, Netflix, and now Facebook and Amazon are committing huge, in some cases, multi billion. Uh, annual budgets on original programming as they're seeking to acquire new customers. Now, several of these players are turning their attention to another key draw, namely sporting rights. This, this kind of acquisition, the acquisition of major sporting rights, can be a key differentiator. When the uh, UK satellite broadcaster Sky bought the rights to the nascent uh, English Premier League 25 uh, years ago, uh, it was the move that enabled it to become a major presence in pay TV. Without it, the broadcaster might not even have survived. Since that time, major sporting rights for football in the UK, uh, for hockey, baseball, basketball and US football in America, for cricket in India, have soared in value uh, as, as additional players have entered the, the bidding wars. And you can see on the right-hand side how the... Uh, Combined cost of Premier League rights has soared in recent seasons. First, it was just the pay TV companies who were involved here. Then, in some markets, they were added, the, the telcos came in as well. But now it's the turn of the streaming companies. So, why next year? Well, firstly, some of the leading OTTs have already started dipping their toes into the sporting waters. In May this year, it was confirmed that Facebook would live stream at least 20 um, major league baseball games during the, the regular season. Um, th those games are not exclusive to Facebook. The company will stream from the feed of a local rights holder, uh, but it would appear to be a test to gauge consumer receptiveness of watching those fixtures via social media. It's also live streaming selected uh, football matches from La Liga, the top division in Spain, for free to its Spanish users. And recently, the, co the company submitted an ultimately unsuccessful $600 million dollar bid for the exclusive worldwide rights to the Indian Premier League cricket tournament. Um, meanwhile, Amazon acquired the streaming rights for 10 Thursday night National Football League games earlier this year. Both of these companies are clearly ex keen to expand into this space, even if Netflix is not. Now, crucially, in early 2018, we'll have the next auction of rights packages for the English Premier League. Bidding makes perfect sense for both Amazon and Facebook. Both have got the financial capabilities to make competitive bids. 
Clearly, the primary beneficiaries um, from such bids, other than the successful bidders themselves, would be the sporting bodies uh, and their attendant members. In 2015, the last time Premier League rights were auctioned, the seven packages on offer uh, cost a combined total of more than £5.1 billion, or uh, $6.8 billion over three seasons. This was a 71% increase on the previous total. Now, while the scale of the increase is unlikely to be as significant in 2018, and we're estimating it will be about 40% up on the previous uh, uh, set of bids, it will push the spending power of the English Premier League to still higher levels. Now, we believe that while both Amazon and Facebook are likely to bid, the uh, Amazon is likely to be the biggest winner here. We expect it to bid for and to win equivalent packages to those currently held by BT. Now, BT successfully bid for two of the seven packages on offer last time, uh, amounting to 42 games uh, per season, uh, for which it paid three, uh, £960 million, pounds, or $1.3 billion over three seasons, or that amounting to £7.6 uh, million pounds per game or $10.3 million. Now, Amazon's key card here is Amazon Prime. Not only would it gain revenues from new Amazon Prime customers joining mainly for the football, but additional, additionally revenues derived from retail sales by those customers via the Prime channel. This significantly reduces uh, the number of new customers it would require to cover the cost of a rights package. A successful Amazon bid would be a game changer and would almost certainly encourage it uh, and its VOD competitors to uh, mount further bids, ultimately setting them up to bid for the biggest uh, prizes of all, the rights to uh, major US sporting events, uh, which are next up for grabs from 2020 onwards. Now, that brings us to the end of uh, this year's uh, top tens. Let's just have a recap of the rankings, now ordered 1 to 10. Uh, right at the top, we've got the OTT bids for sporting rights, um, followed by social payments, uh, followed by uh, AI and blockchain, uh, providing the, the fintech and insurance solutions. Now, I have to say that when we were pulling this list together, a number of different trends had their advocates, but ultimately, the sporting rights bids won out. We believe that this will be a truly disruptive event uh, in 2018. Now, we've already had a, a large number of questions, uh, so many thank you for these. Uh, before we begin, um, I, I'd just like to reiterate that the slide deck will be sent round to registered attendees uh, and a recording uh, made available uh, early next week. Now, Let's go um, on to the questions themselves, and I'm conscious that we've only got time for a few, so we've probably only got time for, for two, I think. Um, firstly, we've got a question for um, uh, we're on social P2P payments. How do you think that the P2P market will develop in the US? You mentioned revisions to your current forecasts. Uh, this is one for you, I think, uh, Nitin. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so, if you take the US, um, I mean, uh, we've witnessed a greater levels of domestic P2P adoption uh, in the US uh, following the launch of uh, especially Zelle Network in the US early, uh, early this year. And following this, there is an increased, uh, we've witnessed an increased level of activity uh, with the announcement of Apple Pay Cash and also uh, the launch of uh, uh, Zelle's payment app. Uh, so, we expect that uh, the US will see a significant uh, rise in uh, P2P money transfer transactions uh, starting this year to, and also over the next three years uh, with domestic, uh, mo you know, domestic mobile money transfer uh, adoption expected to rise. Uh, in terms of uh, the various players um, in, in the US, uh, we think when more uh, will face greater challenge uh, from the likes of these new players. Um, our revised forecast numbers for the US uh, are now available to download from our digital money transfer remittances uh, research page, so please uh, do check that out. Um, is that okay, Windsor? Yeah. Oh, that, that's great, Nitin. Thank you. 
Um, now we've got uh, time for one more question, which is about financial institutions. Why will FIs, which are usually slow to uh, adopt, uh, adopt new technology, rush to adopt digital identity solutions? Um, Nick, could you feel this one? Yeah, absolutely, Windsor. Um, I think the most compelling reason here is, is money. Banks will rush to adopt new digital identity technologies as, you know, they spend a vast amount of time processing Know Your Customer checks. Digital identity, based upon machine learning techniques, has a massive potential to save them that money. And that's just too compelling a driver for the banks to ignore. Thanks, uh, Nick. And I think now that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, firstly, I'd like to reiterate that uh, any questions that we haven't addressed during the course of the Q&A uh, can be addressed via email afterwards. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank both of my colleagues, Nitin Bass and Nick Maynard, and I'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great day and goodbye.